a great sound, isn't it? The sound of crashing ten pins. This is Fred Wolf and our greatest bowlers. With me, the manager and members of Detroit's famous championship Strohs team, the greatest pin-spilling machine in bowling history. Mort Luby, the dean of the nation's bowling writers and the game's foremost authority, flatly states, quote, in my book, Strohs is the best team ever put together, and no other team can match its amazing record, end of quote. Luby is the publisher of the National Bowlers Journal and the man who picks the annual All-American teams, and he has seen the best of them come and go over the past 30 years. A recital of all the championships and feats of the Strohs team would last hours, so we'll just mention a couple of the more noteworthy recent accomplishments carved by Captain Buzz Fazio and his brilliant teammates, Lee Juglard, Tony Lindemann, Eddie Lebanski, Tom Hennessy, and Pete Carter. For four straight years, beginning in 1951, Stroh's led fields of the nation's premier quintets in world five-man match game championship tournaments. Winning the annual meet even one year is a rare trick, but bagging it four years in a row strains the imagination. Fans in St. Paul, Minnesota, still rave about the spectacular show Strohs put on up there in the 1951 American Bowling Congress Tournament. The Detroiters lived up to their fire-flung reputations by registering an all-time high team all-events count of 95.06, which boils down to an average of more than 211 per man per game. Detroit long has been known for its abundance of outstanding bowlers. Its all-star leagues are packed with power. For a number of years now, Strohs has pummeled this tough competition into meek submission. Strohs holds the all-time national high-sanctioned team triplicate. Three consecutive games of 11:44, Games of 1,200, series of 3,400 are common for the Strohs team. The team's average over the full season in league play rarely dips under 10.25 per game. Last season, Strohs compiled a phenomenal team average of 10.70 per game, and that comes to 32.10 every time out. In the last three years alone, at least a dozen important tournaments have been captured by the Strohs team. We're going to have you meet these outstanding bowlers tell you some interesting things about them, cite a few of their major individual feats and triumphs, let you in on how they do it. Yes, the Strohs know-how, gained through years of experience, is going to be passed on to you. We feel it'll help you bowl better, make your journey down the Maple Road smoother and much more enjoyable. Let's first talk with Carl Peters, the manager of this fabulous team. Carl is a graying gentleman who always looks like he just stepped out of one of those man of distinction ads. Well, Carl, just how do you feel about being manager of the highest scoring team in bowling history? Fred, I'm very proud to be associated with such a fine group of bowlers and fine gentlemen. Suppose you tell us the inside story about the building of this great team and just how are such rare talents ever brought together? It goes back almost 20 years. There are certain standards that we favor and follow throughout the years. Personality is very important, and good sportsmanship is very important. We look for proper team spirit, not individualists. That's the kind of men we want to wear the Stroh banner. We expect our bowlers to be gentlemen at all times and to not only win games, but also make many friends. We know that the Strohs team is in great demand everywhere with radio and television appearances. About how many miles a year does the team travel to take in exhibitions and fill its many tournament engagements? I would say about 50,000. 50,000 miles? Do you uh, cover quite a few of these miles yourself? I do, Fred. You love to be with your team. Yes. Do you, do you arrange all of the appearances? Yes, they're all arranged from the office. And I can say that we've watched you in the front row pulling the Stroh team home at many important tournaments. Thank you, Carl Peters, longtime manager 
of the great Stroh's team. Now let's meet Buzz Fazio, the colorful little pepper pot who holds the reins for the Stroh team. Buzz is 47 years old, 5 feet 6 inches tall, weighs 140 pounds, has been bowling for 23 years. In 1955, he won the ABC Masters Tournament at Fort Wayne, Indiana, the George Ballas Singles at Youngstown, Ohio, the Detroit Times Singles. He won the National Match Game Doubles Eliminations three times with teammate Tony Lindemann, shot one of Detroit's highest league series, a Husky 802 for three games, and he wound up the 1955 season with league averages of 205 and 213. These and many other bright performances earned Buzz a spot on Mort Luby's number one All-American team for 1955, the fourth straight year that Fazio made Luby's number one squad. His lifetime high league average is 221. He has rolled 16 perfect scores, has an 856 series, and has won 121 trophies. Fazio has made command appearances on the lanes up and down the West Coast, Hawaii, and throughout all of Europe. Besides being one of bowling's greats, he's a real showman. Buzz, you gave exhibitions in Hawaii in 1955. Tell us about bowling's popularity in Hawaii. Do the people go for the game there as they do here? Yes, they do, Fred. Popularity is tremendous. In fact, so that they bowl 24 hours a day. They have very good newspaper coverage plus TV and radio shows. What about the Hawaii bowling establishments, Buzz, and the bowling conditions? The establishments are modern, fine places to go into. The conditions are wonderful. And I understand that uh, in your recent trip to Hawaii, you found the conditions very favorable by turning in some tremendous scores. Yes, one stands out in my mind very much. I shot 762. For three games. Correct. Buzz, do they have any great stars coming up in Hawaii? They have a few 200 average bowlers, but they have a lot of bowlers in the class of 175 to 195. I'm sure that's certainly a lot of news to our bowling fans. Suppose we go back a year or two, or shall we go back three? Where and how did you start bowling? It was in Akron, Ohio, Fred, at the height of depression. I needed a job, so I went in and got a job as pit setter. And you were a pin setter for a short while, and you finally decided to try bowling yourself. Yes, Fred. In fact, it was only a week, and, and I started bowling. What was your first game? 86. 86. And you've come a long way since that time. Buzz, what do you consider to be your biggest thrill? My biggest thrill, Fred, is when I was asked to come to Detroit to fill Joe Norris's shoes as captain of the Stro team. My constant thrill is in seeing the Stro team on top. And they certainly have been on top a good many times since you left Akron, Ohio. That was Buzz Fazio, folks, a guy they'll remember in bowling for a long, long time. Now let's meet young Eddie Lebansky, a man of 25 summers who stands 5 feet 10 inches, weighs 200 pounds. He's been bowling for 13 years. A couple of years ago, Eddie was a minor league pitcher who was good enough to be called a fine prospect for the major leagues, but he gave it up for bowling. Baseball's loss turned out to be bowling's gain for Eddie has evolved into one of the 10-pin sports' top stars. In January of 1955, Lebansky appeared to be a surefire winner in the big all-star tournament at Chicago, the event which annually determines the world's individual match game champion. Eddie had roared through the finals, and only Steve Nagy stood between him and the coveted crown. But at this point, Dame Fortune suddenly deserted Lebansky and took up with Nagy. In the ultimate four-game set, Nagy averaged a spectacular 234 to tear the title out of Lebansky's grasp. Eddie's average in the 64-game finals was an impressive 210, better than any other hot shot in the field. Lebansky was Detroit's best league bowler in 1954 and 55, coming up with averages of 212 and 215. He was also tops in the Motor City in 1952 and 53, with an aggregate mark of 211 in two leagues. 
Eddie, who shared the World's Match Game Doubles Championship with Sarge Ed Easter when he was only 20, is the winner of more bowling honors in the last couple of years than you can shake the proverbial stick at. He was named on the All-American team in 1953, in 54, and again in 1955. His lifetime bests are a 216 league average, an 826 three-game series. He has shot 10 perfect scores, and he owns 63 individual trophies. Eddie losing the world title and the approximate $25,000 that goes with it was a real heartbreaker. Tell us just what happened. Well, Fred, uh, I still don't know what actually happened. Uh, when I started the last four games of the 100 we had bowled, I thought I would be the next world's champion. Uh, but I ran into a little trouble and Nagy caught fire, and I mean he really caught fire. I would say he caught fire. I understand he averaged about 245 for the last three games of that four-game series, and it's no disgrace to lose to scores like that. That's right. Well, maybe the next time the ending will be a happier one for you. Speaking of bowling, how did you get into the game, Eddie? Well, I started at the age of 12, Fred. Uh, my dad was a pretty fair bowler, and he decided uh, to see if I could throw a bowling ball, and I've been bowling ever since. I understand you were quite a sandlot ball player. Well, I played at it. And uh, you had an offer to go to the minor leagues, which you did. You were considered a major league prospect. You gave up baseball for 10 pins. That's the story. Have you ever regretted that decision? No, I haven't, Fred. I've enjoyed every minute of uh, the bowling career I've had up to now. And you've had a lot of thrills, I'm sure. Just what is your top thrill in your bowling life? Well, there are a few thrills, but I guess the greatest one is winning the national doubles title with Sergeant Ed Easter when I was 20 years old. Uh, I think it was 1950. Eddie, thank you very much. Thank Eddie Lebanski, you. a young man you'll be hearing from more and more as the years go by. The next Stroh star we're going to meet is Tom Hennessy, aptly tagged Three Star Hennessy. Tom's timing is so perfect that he makes the game look ridiculously easy. This is his 13th year at it. He's 30 years old, stands 5 feet 8 inches, tips the scales at 180 pounds. A tough customer in tournaments, in 1955, Hennessy landed sixth in the All-Star, shot 738 to lead Strohs to the Central States Championship, won the Ned Day singles at Chicago, and the Frank Carr Individual Classic at Fort Wayne, Indiana. He averaged 205 for 24 games as Stroh successfully defended its world's match game crown against Maybach of Akron, Ohio. In a challenge doubles match with Eddie Lebanski against Harry Smith and Steve Nagy, then of Cleveland, Tom rattled off an unbelievable 250 average in the last block of eight games to boost his average to 225 over the entire route of 32 games. Tom is one of the nation's top money winners in the annual Peterson Classic in Chicago. He won the fabulous event in 1949, placed second in 1951. Another of his deeper notches is the Michigan State Match Game Singles Championship, which he won in 1953. Tom turned in averages of 205 and 217 in 1955, and he showed his bowling wares at Army layouts in France Spain, Germany, North Africa, and England. He has 34 trophies in his collection. He has rolled six perfect scores, has a league series of 807, and has twice compiled a season league average of 217. Well, Tom, where and under what circumstances did you and bowling get together? I started bowling in Granite City, Illinois, just to pass the time with some friends. But when the bug bit me, and I needed more money to practice and improve, I took to pin setting. That's uh, a little different than most of the boys. Most of the boys start as pin setters. You went to pin setting after you learned how to bowl. Very interesting. Tom, what's the big thrill of your bowling life? Winning the Peterson Classic in 1949 was my biggest thrill, Fred. I'd like you to tell us about something else that we think must have been a thrill, that 250 average that you shot in the closing block in that doubles match you and Eddie Lebanski had against Steve Nagy and Harry Smith at Rainbow. Did you use a wand or something? How can a guy knock over that many pins? 
conditions were favorable for high scoring and it just happened to be my on night. Also, there's a certain amount of luck involved in bowling and I had my share. I would say you're being very modest, my boy. What about your recent trip to Europe, uh, Tom? Anything interesting? Seeing the interest the armed forces had in bowling over there and the number of alley beds really amazed me. It's a trip I'll always remember. Thank you, Tom Hennessy. The next man we meet is Pete Carter, a chap noted for his consistently good performances in all types of competition and under varying conditions. Pete is 45, 5 feet 11 and a half inches, weighs 185 pounds, and has been bowling for 19 years. He's steady, conscientious, and a hard worker out there on the drives. Sometimes you don't even know he's around. Then all of a sudden, a big game screams out at you, and lo and behold, it's Pete Carter. Carter outclassed Detroit's finest in 1953 and 54, checking in with a 125-game cross-alley average of 212 to pace the Detroit Times Rainbow Individual Classic. He's always a threat in the National All-Star Meet, and his name usually can be found among the leaders in the nation's headline individual tourneys. Last year, Pete came up with a season average of 217 to pace the pack in the strong Detroit Major Classic League. It was his best league performance. His top series, a 774. He boasts five 300 scores, and he has won 36 trophies. Well, Pete, tell us about your start in bowling. I started as a pen setter, Freddie. What in your career has given you your biggest thrill? I sincerely believe that playing a minor role in helping the Stroh's team to win four World's Match Game Championships. Pete, I'd like to put you on a limb here. Whom do you consider to be the greatest bowler of all time? That's not too hard to answer, Freddie. Joe Norris. I think he's the most inspiring leader and match game bowler I have ever seen. I think you'll agree with this, Pete, that there are more good bowlers around today than there were, say, 25 years ago. Now, why is this? Today's bowlers start at a younger age. There are countless junior bowling programs all over the country. There are certainly more bowling establishments today than there were. And the instructional facilities are much better. All of these factors contribute to better bowling. Would you say that modern equipment would have anything to do with this? Yes, definitely so. Thank you, Pete Carter. Now let's meet another member of the celebrated Stroh's team, Tony Lindemann, whose lane side feats are as loud as Tony is quiet. Lindemann stands five feet eight and a half inches tall, weighs 150 pounds, has been a bowler for 19 of his 36 years. Lindy's delivery is so smooth and flawless, it seems to give out a silken purr, and his ball is dynamite. He's a Johnny-come-lately to all-star ranks, but he's making up for lost time fast. Tony skyrocketed to national fame in 1951, the year he shared the national match game doubles title with Buzz Fazio and fired a nine-game total of 2005 to capture the ABC All Events. That was the year, too, that he led the city's league bowlers with an aggregate average of 209 in two all-star circuits. All of this gave him a spot on the number one All-American team in 1951, and Tony's been going great guns ever since. He won the Michigan State Tournament Singles Championships, the Scovey Singles at Chicago in 1954. Lindemann's league averages in 1955 were 204 and 215. His lifetime records are a league average of 215, seven perfect scores, an 857 three-game series, and some 67 trophies have been won by Tony Lindemann. Well, Tony, where and how were you introduced to bowling? Well, Fred, I come from a small town in Wisconsin called Beaverdam and uh, we've only had uh, one small bowling alley there, so I never did do any bowling there, so it was a trip into Milwaukee where I was actually introduced to the game. Tony, when did you move to Detroit? 
It was on New Year's Day of 1942, Fred. And how long have you been in the All-Star Leagues? I think it was 1944 that I broke in. How long have you been a member of the Stroh team? Since 1950. Isn't there a story connected with you becoming a member of the Stroh team? Yes, there is, Fred. Uh, it was 1949 that uh, Buzz asked me to uh, join their team. Well, being as great a team as they always had previous years, why, it was uh, sort of scared me. So uh, I was a little reluctant to join the first year because I only had one good season where I actually bowled good, so I thought that I, if I would get another good season, why, uh, I might be ready. In other words, you, as an up-and-coming star, actually refused a chance to bowl with the Great Stro team in 1949. Is that the story? That's right, Fred. And you took the chance of maintaining your type of play to still feel that you might get another chance in 1950? Yes, I did, Fred. You did get that chance in 1950, and I'm sure that the entire Stro team feels very good about it. Tony, what was your biggest thrill in bowling? I believe my biggest thrill in bowling has been when I won the American Bowling Congress All Events title in 1951 in St. Paul. And you won that title against some 40,000 bowlers who are trying to win the very same title. Certainly a wonderful job. Thank you, Tony Lindemann. And now we come to the mighty might, Lee Juglard, who functions so effectively as Stroh's anchor man. Lee is 33 years old, 5 feet 9 inches tall, weighs 135 pounds, ringing wet. He's been shaking up the pins for 14 years now, and few bowlers ever have had a single season that measured up to the one Lee had in 1951. He finished second in the All-Star Tournament, blazed to an all-time high of 775 for three games in the ABC singles, shot 2,000 in the ABC All Events, and won the ABC Masters title, the Canton, Ohio singles, the Detroit Times singles. It not only made Juglard an All-American that year, but also swung the Bowler of the Year award his way. Little Lee hasn't slackened his pace. He has added a mess of other titles to his collections since that time. Coming through in the clutch is Juglard's specialty, a happy knack that has helped make Strohs almost invincible in league competition. Lee wound up the 1954-55 season with league averages of 207 and 214. His lifetime bests are a 217 average, an 802 league series. He boasts 10 perfect scores, including one rolled on a television show, and he has won 48 trophies. Well, Lee, where and how did you begin bowling? Well, Fred, I started bowling in Oxnard, California. It just happened that it was my 20th birthday. We were having a little celebration, and one of my buddies took me by the arm and led me to the bowling alley, and there I started with a hop, skip, and a jump. I would say you've improved that hop, skip, and a jump, boy. What has been your number one bowling thrill? I believe my number one thrill came in 1951 when I was elected the Bowler of the Year. What about your biggest disappointment in bowling? Well, I believe you were there at the time, Fred, when in the hundredth and final game at the National Match Game Eliminations in Chicago, I was defeated. I would say it made a very fine network television show, regardless of your disappointment. Lee, how about that record-smashing total of 775 in the ABC singles? Now, the old record holder was Larry Shotwell of Covington, Kentucky, who fired 774 in 1930. Now, it took 21 years to crack Shotwell's mark. How long do you think that your 775 will hold up? Well, I hope it holds up for quite some time, but records are made to be broken, and I really couldn't say. I think it'll be a long time before somebody can come along with a 776. Thank you very much, Lee Juglard. And bowling fans, that about completes the bowling machine that stands alone in the annals of the 10-pin sport. Well, bowlers, you've met the great Strohs team. You've heard a lot of interesting things about the members. You've been told of some, but only a few, of the countless feats hung up by the Strohs team, both as a unit 
and individually. We hope you have enjoyed meeting the greatest bowlers. Well, here we are, bowling fans. This is Fred Wolf, ready to absorb with you the proper fundamentals of the game as preached and practiced by the world champion Stroh's bowlers. You're about to learn the innermost secrets of the Stroh's team's tremendous success. Everything you want to know about better bowling, every vital facet of the sport, the shortcuts to stardom, what should be done, what shouldn't be done. Let's start with Pete Carter. Pete, we know that proper equipment is an important factor in any sport. We know a person doesn't have to own his own equipment, but why is it better if one does? Well, Fred, I'm sure that a bowler can derive more confidence and pleasure out of owning his equipment, and it'll add to his better bowling. Pete, let's start with bowling shoes. What makes a good pair of bowling shoes? Well, primarily for the right-handed bowler, the left or sliding shoe must have a leather sole. The right sole, being a breaking and stopping sole, should be of rubber with a hard rubber or leather tip to prevent excessive wear. The quality of the upper part of the shoe is usually controlled by the cost of the shoe. Today, bowling shoes are orthopedically perfect. Pete, how does a pair of good bowling shoes help your game? Well, footwork being an important element in good bowling, you can readily see that a pair of good bowling shoes is a must. The summary is, every bowler should have his own bowling shoes. Let's turn to the bowling ball, Pete. Why is it important to own your own bowling ball? Well, elimination of searching for a ball to fit your hand on a bowling league night, and it seldom does. Also, you're lucky if you find that same ball again that you used the previous week. And most important, owning your own ball adds confidence and assurance to your game. How is one properly fitted? You can be fitted at your favorite bowling establishment, department store, and sporting goods store who make a specialty of selling bowling balls. How can you tell, Pete, that you have a proper fit? Insert thumb into thumb hole. Stretch your hand toward finger holes and look at the second crease of the middle finger joint. If it is a quarter, of an inch to halfway over the edge of the hole, the span or grip should be comfortable. The thumb hole should never be too tight or too loose. The finger hole should never be tight. Why is it best to leave the entire fitting of a ball in the hands of qualified experts? Well, even as a suit of clothes is tailored to your body measurements, a bowling ball is also custom fitted to your hand measurements. By all means, consult an expert. Pete, I think the weight of a bowling ball is important. Should a bowler use the conventional weight of 16 pounds, or would you say that it would be advisable in some cases to use a ball that is lighter in weight? Well, Freddie, the ABC ruling, the American Bowling Congress ruling on this question, is that a male or female bowler can use a ball weighing not less than 10 pounds, nor more than 16 pounds. Certainly, if a bowler's physical makeup is such that a 16-pound ball feels too heavy, by all means, use a lighter ball. How about the ladies? Should the ladies use a lighter ball? Yes, definitely, especially beginners. Pete, sore fingers and blisters. What causes sore fingers and blisters? I found that a short grip or an extremely wide grip or tight holes will do it, Fred. How should a bowling ball be held, or shall we say, gripped? The weight of the ball should be supported by the left hand underneath the ball. The ball should be held by the right hand firmly. Let's go back 20, 30, 40, 50 years. Years ago, all bowlers used two-finger balls. Today, practically all bowlers use three-finger balls. Why is this? It's a matter of progress and education. The three-fingered ball is easier to hold and easier to bowl with, I think. Pete, there are various types of grips, various types of ways that the holes are put into a ball. Now, there are a lot of them on the market. What do you think of them? Well, they're all good to those that can use them, but unless you have the means and the time to experiment with the different types of grips, leave them alone. 
Which grip would you say would be the best for a beginner? Well, Fred, I started with a conventional three-fingered grip, and I still believe that's the best, the conventional three-fingered ball. Well, it certainly looks like there's a lot of depth to good bowling, doesn't there? That was Pete Carter preparing us for things to come. Now let's talk shop with Tony Lindemann. Tony, what kind of a ball and grip do you use? Fred, I use a three-fingered ball, and it is a wide conventional grip. How does your ball roll? Just outside the thumb hole. How many steps do you take? Four and one half. Tony, it is understood that you watch a spot about three or four feet from the foul line. That's right, Fred. I find it a little easier to watch a spot close than it is to watch one out farther on the alley. But I also pick another spot out near the dovetail or where the boards join, and I try to roll my ball directly over those two spots. Do you spot bowl for spares? Yes, I do, Fred. Could you offer some advice for shooting at spares? Well, I think the best advice is never relax on any spare, regardless how many pins or if it's just a single pin. In other words, you feel that there is no such thing as an easy spare. That's right. How do you cover the five pin and the other center alley setups? We usually cover the five pin or center alley spares by using our regular, normal strike position. How about the seven pin and the left side spares? We usually stand in the center of the alley, but we point our left toe more directly to those pins and shoot cross alley at them. And how about the 10 pin and the right side spares? We usually move left of center and shoot cross alley at those spares. Tony, your delivery is just about as smooth as they come. We know that the stance and the push away can make or break one's approach. How do you address the pins and start your delivery? Well, Fred, I pick the ball up off the rack with both hands. I never insert my fingers. Then I assume my regular strike stance, holding the ball chest high, facing the pins squarely with my shoulders, with my left foot extended slightly in line with the two pin. The ball is pushed away simultaneously with the first step. It is pushed forward, not up or immediately down. The weight of the ball provides the momentum. There never is any forced action on the part of the bowler. And there are the bowling secrets of Tony Lindemann. Next to step up to the blackboard is the LAY's captain of the Stroh's outfit, Buzz Fazio. Well, Buzz, how many games do you bowl on an average per week, including leagues and tournaments? About 75, Fred. 75. How often do you just practice? Every day. When you're practicing, Buzz, what do you do to get the most out of it? I try to perfect my footwork plus the release of the bowling ball. Buzz, about how many games a week should a bowler practice to achieve consistency and to maintain a 200 average? I'd say about four or five games a day. In addition to regular league and tournament competition? Correct. What kind of a ball, Buzz, and what kind of a grip do you use? I roll a three-hole ball, and it's a full fingertip grip. How does your ball roll? Between the thumb and fingers. Now, how many steps do you take? Four and a half. Buzz, when you bowl, do you spot bowl or do you look at the pins? I spot bowl, Fred. And why? I believe it's a lot easier to roll a ball over the spot at 15, 20 feet than it is to try to hit the pocket at 60 feet away. Well, that certainly sounds sensible. Which would you say is the most effective? A slow ball, medium speed ball, or a fast ball? I will say the medium speed ball, Freddie. And why? Because if you roll the ball too slow, the ball breaks too soon, and then it dies out. A fast ball has a tendency of skidding, and the pins do not mix well. Well, Buzz, as we know, there are various conditions in various bowling establishments in various parts of the country. How do you adjust your angle under conditions that vary? 
Well, Freddie, first thing you do when you walk up on the approach, you try to deliver the ball as natural as possible, which is your own natural delivery. You find from that whether your ball breaks too fast or does not break at all. That will tell you what to do. If it breaks too much, you move left of center and you roll the ball out to your spot, which is in line with the three pin. If the alleys are slick, then you move to your right of your spot and roll the ball directly toward it. Now, Buzz, does speed have anything to do here in uh, connection with your various angles? Yes, it does, Fred. Try to maintain your natural speed. Don't throw it too hard and don't try to throw it too slow. Now, you mentioned your natural delivery. Would you tell us what is your natural delivery? My natural delivery is I place my left foot in line with the head pin and I draw an imaginary line from the three pin up to where I'm standing. Where it crosses at the dovetail or the splice, that is my spot. I roll the ball directly over it. Well, that certainly uh, seems to be the answer, Buzz. I'd like to ask you one more question. Tell us what makes a good approach. Now, I'd like you to tell us what to do and what not to do once you're on your way to the foul line. As you are approaching the foul line, take your natural stride. Let the ball swing freely. Don't hurry the swing and release it the same way. Do not try to turn the ball too hard. Do not weave while you are approaching the foul line. Do not turn sideways. Do not fall off on your right foot as you deliver the ball. Thank you very much, Buzz Fazio, and that certainly should be helpful to all bowlers. And now let's call in Eddie Lebansky. Eddie, you're the only man on the Stroh's team who uses a two-fingered ball. Now, do you recommend a two-fingered ball? Well, Fred, I have tried a two-fingered ball and a three-fingered ball, but I have had more success with a two-fingered ball. I would say you have had a lot of success with a two-fingered ball, Eddie. How does your bowling ball roll? My ball rolls outside the thumb hole, which is called a semi-roller. How many steps in your delivery? I take five steps, Fred. Eddie, are you a spot bowler or a pin bowler? Neither, Fred. I am an imaginary line bowler. In other words, I try to pick out an imaginary line in my mind from the head pin to the foul line where I want my ball to roll. Eddie, which of these methods would you recommend to a beginner? Well, I would recommend pin bowling, Fred. And after a year or more, then the bowler should have enough knowledge to start picking an imaginary line or spots on the alley. Let's get back to your game. What do you concentrate on the most when bowling? Well, Fred, I try to concentrate on where I want my ball to roll, but my biggest point of concentration is when I take the ball off the rack and set myself up with the ball in my hands be as before I release the ball. Let's turn to etiquette briefly, Eddie. What part does etiquette play in bowling today? Well, I think etiquette is a very important factor, Fred. It, it can make the game very enjoyable. Things that annoy all of us are when someone on an adjoining alley goes up to the foul line when we do, or when they bend over to pick up a ball on the return rack when we are addressing the pins. Now, I have a question, Eddie. Does it help you to take a lot of extra time, or do you feel that you can bowl better by bowling faster? Well, Fred, uh, I think taking too much time can be very troublesome, and also hurrying up to the line or hurrying up yourself can be very troublesome also. We should try to strike a happy medium. Now, let's talk about slide and release. I'm sure that you'll agree both slide and release are vitally important links in the chain of things that make up a sound delivery. You certainly have a sound delivery. Eddie, tell us how the slide and the release should be properly executed. Well, Fred, the slide should be entered into very easily, ending from one to four inches from the fall line. The release should be effortless and unhurried, applying a lifting action when the ball is pitched 
about two feet out on the alley. Well, we're sure learning a lot of things about bowling, aren't we? That was Eddie Lebansky making his contribution to our bowling education. And here comes a guy who will add more to your bowling knowledge, Tom Hennessy. Well, Tom, first tell us about your ball and grip. I use a semi-fingertip, three-finger ball. In other words, I put my fingers in between the first and second joint with my thumb buried. Tom, what kind of a working ball is it? My ball rolls outside the thumb hole, which is classified as a semi-roller. How many steps do you take? I take four and a half steps, Fred. Do you spot bowl, Tom, or do you look at the pins? I spot bowl. Where on the alley do you eye your spot? I pick my spot eight to ten boards from the gutter and about 16 feet from the foul line. Tom, how can a person who is unable to get out and practice improve his game at home? By reading good bowling literature, such as Bowling to Win by the Stroh Team, edited by Steve Crushan. Also, if a mirror is available at home, practice in front of a mirror your release and your approach. If that isn't available, if you have your own bowling ball, by releasing your ball so that you can get the feel of how your fingers come out, throwing it into a big heavy chair. And you would advise the ball to end up in the chair each time? Yes, I would, Fred. Not on your foot. <laughs> Tom, we all know the importance of a good follow-through. Many big stars admire your follow-through. What advice can you give us in this connection? At the extreme finish, your hand should be stretched well out in front of you in line with the target. It should look like you're reaching for your target. Don't stop short or jerk back on your follow through. Thank you, Tom Hennessy. And my average just went up a couple of pins. Well, bowlers, that took us all the way through the delivery, but school isn't out yet. If you want to become a really accomplished bowler, there still are a couple of things that you should know. So step up here, Lee Juglard, and tell the folks. But before you get started, Lee, I think bowlers would like to know what kind of a ball and grip you use, and the kind of working ball you roll. Well, Fred, I use a three-fingered ball. It's a fingertip grip, a very wide grip, and it's a full roller. It rolls between the fingers and the thumb. Lee, you use a three-step delivery, don't you? Yes, I do, Fred. Do you recommend a three-step approach, or do you advise bowlers to take more steps? I would say that the bowler should take more than three steps. I started quite some time ago with three steps. It came very natural to me, and it's held me in good stead ever since. I think you have mastered the three-step approach, Lee. There's no doubt about that. I understand also that you look at the pins when bowling. Do you feel this is a better method than spot bowling? Well, I don't actually look at the pins, Fred. I concentrate on the pocket. There's a difference. and. I don't believe that this is a better method than spot bowling, but it, it's the way that I learned, and I feel much better doing it that way. Lee, you're known for the powerhouse that you roll. Now, how does one attain that desired thing that they call, in bowling, stuff? First, I would say you should relax. That is one of the primary rules. Then, make sure that your fingers are underneath and to the side of the ball. Now, when you're coming through, your thumb comes out first, your fingers lift the ball with a smooth, easy, effortless swing. Lee, explain the skidding and then the gripping action of a hook ball or a curve ball. In throwing a hook or a curve, the ball should be thrown over the foul line. Now, when the ball does hit beyond the foul line, it skids a number of feet. It's hard to say just how far. Then it begins its forward roll before striking the pins. Why is it better to roll a hook or a curve than, say, a straight ball or possibly a backup? Well, the pins mix better when you throw a hook or a curve. And not only that, a straight ball or a backup will deflect when it hits the pocket, thereby leaving some of the back pins standing. Well, Lee, speaking of the back pins, tell us what makes a bowler leave such pins as the 5-pin, the 5-7, the 8-pin, or the 8-10. Now you're pitching curves, Fred. That's kind of a tough one. 
Actually, there's many factors that influence the action of the pins. There's the angle, the speed, and many times just pure luck. And that's what makes the game of bowling so interesting and why so many people are bowling today. One more question. Why does the 10 pin stand on a perfect pocket hit? There again, you're pitching a curve. But there has to be a carom from the three pin to the six pin to the 10 pin. And quite often, that carom is not the same. Well, bowlers, that's it. Your course to bowling enjoyment and success has been thoroughly charted. The rest is up to you. And so from the greatest bowlers, the Strohs team, manager Carl Peters, Captain Buzz Fazio, Pete Carter, Tony Lindemann, Eddie Lebanski, Tom Hennessy, Lee Juglard, and yours truly, Fred Wolf. Good luck, good bowling.